Welcome to Conversations with Z and Vindesh, a weekly discussion that explores common life challenges and offers practical solutions. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. That's D H A R M A media.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Conversations. And Z, uh, it's me, you, and Caitlin, and we're talking about love. We're talking about loving people to death. So when you love them so much that you're actually killing them. And this is an interesting topic because I've seen this firsthand in a few different situations. I think the most obvious is when you have a, a, a child and you think about your child, you want to spare them pain. You want to spare them suffering. Uh, this is the prime drive of a parent. How can I make sure that my kid isn't screaming, isn't crying, isn't in physical agony, isn't bruised emotionally? And so you end up doing things that maybe aren't in the best interest of your child. So in a particular moment, perhaps you protect them and you save them uh, from a situation that's uncomfortable. They're screaming and complaining, so you give them some sugar to calm them down. You let them go on the iPad and do whatever they want. Uh, You tell them that it's okay. They have too much homework. It's too hard. We get it. We're on your side. We're going to go and talk to the teacher about this. Maybe they get to high school or college and they don't get a job. And so then you call up the employer and you say, what the hell is going on? You got to take my kid. And so at each step in the way, because you love your child so much, you're trying to protect your child, spare your child. But in doing that, you prevent them from building character. And they never get the resilience that they need to survive in life, manage these situations, and really stand on their own two feet. In fact, I've gone through this myself. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm at that extreme. But if I look at my life, I've never suffered for anything materially. And what that's meant for me is that perhaps I've never been fully committed to things that I wanted to try out. So I've gone into businesses. I've tried different ventures in the past. And there's a part of me which always knew, okay, I've got a fallback. I've got a safety net. If this if this doesn't work out, I can go back and do what I've been doing, or I can go into the family business. I've got a plan B. And perhaps that's the reason that these things never worked out. Like I didn't have enough of a fire under my ass uh, to really get out there. Or maybe I wasn't used to to navigating these types of challenges. And I think I am at this point. I mean, I've developed over the years. Uh, but at the time, you know, it was the upside and also the downside of being in a situation where my parents have done well. Uh, they're really looking to take care of me and my sisters. And that's great because we can feel safe and secure. But on the other hand, maybe there are parts of our character that never fully develop until later in life. So that's one example. Another example that we've been talking about is in relationships. And you see this a lot of the time where you've got codependent relationships. You've got partners who want to spare the other partner from pain. And if they've got dysfunctional behavior, one partner might step in and say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make your life easy, to make it flow and to make it be smooth. And again, sounds great on paper, and you could argue, okay, maybe that's a noble thing to do or seemingly noble thing to do. Uh, But again, it's too much of a safety net because we all need a certain amount of challenge. We all need to struggle a little bit. And if the things that we're doing aren't working in life, so if we're not on the right track in terms of our career, or we have substance abuse problems, or we're not making enough money to survive, we have to experience a little bit of that pain. Because if we don't experience that pain, then we don't necessarily have the motivation to change and to evaluate and step back and say, hey, the things that I'm doing aren't working. I need to go in a different direction. And it's a balance. We don't want catastrophic pain. So you don't want someone to be out on the street, someone that you love, and not have any food, not have any shelter, perhaps starve to death, freeze to death. You want to provide some assistance, make sure that they can get to the other side. But you also don't want to enable whatever the bad behavior is that's causing that situation in the first place. And a lot of times in relationships, you see this, where these patterns go on for years and years, and people are in dysfunctional situations because they've got someone else they can lean on. They've got someone else who can take care of whatever the problems are that come up, so they never learn how to take care of themselves. And maybe that's really the theme of this podcast, Z, when we love people so much that we don't give them the ability to take care of themselves, uh, to grow, to develop, to recognize their limitations. Maybe we don't provide feedback. Uh, So we might have someone in the family and they say, oh, how am I doing? You know, I feel like I'm out of shape. I'm I'm overweight. 
I don't have any friends. And instead of saying, well, you got to get off your ass and go to the gym, or you got to go out, you got to make more of an effort, or go and brush your teeth because your breath is so bad that no one wants to hang around you. We say something like, no, you're perfectly fine. You're wonderful the way that you are. Just love yourself. Trust yourself. The rest of the world will come around. Honestly, when I'm talking about the Z, it sounds kind of like the body positivity movement. So we have people who are grossly overweight, grossly unhealthy, but they're part of a community which tells them that it's okay to be this way. Not only is it okay, but you should celebrate being this way and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And that's a form of a disease. I mean, not just the fact that you're unhealthy, but the community that you're a part of is supporting that pathological behavior and really perpetuating whatever the problem is that got you to that place, perpetuating unhealthiness, uh, perpetuating dysfunctional behavior. And when you think about all of this, I think we need to be able to recognize that, yeah, we do love people, but what does that mean when we love people? It doesn't mean that we want to do things to make them feel good all the time. We want to do things that are in their best interest. And sometimes when we think we're helping them, maybe we're really helping us. Uh, so if I go back to that parent example, I don't want to hear my kid cry. And so I feel like, yeah, I'm going to give my kid whatever they want to make them feel good because I love them so much. But really, it's because I can't bear that pain. And I can't step away from the situation and, and recognize that it's just part of growing up. And that's a normal process that they have to go through. And so I think it's a pretty interesting discussion. Z, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. I mean, maybe I'll just throw it back to you. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this concept of loving people to the point where we suffocate them to death. Well, the whole thing is the word love. I, I, again, I, I love the meaning of things. It's unsolicited devotion. One of the old definitions of love in the simplest terms was unsolicited devotion. So you think about you're, you're, you're just enamored. You have a sentimental attachment. You have dreams and history and stories that you put upon this object of your praise and love. And it's easy for the ego to hijack that. It's very easy for the ego to hijack. So you could have your kids. Everybody thinks their kids are wonderful and special. Most of our kids are lucky to be mediocre. Um, but they're yours. So the mediocrity goes from the bronze medal or the tin medal to it's overly embellished until it's a silver or gold medal because it's yours. And that's where the ego begins to create its toxic brew. When it comes to people in your social circle, you want to be part of the ideal social circle. So you often will judge those people in a certain manner and embellish them with with your love and your devotion and affection far beyond their station of, of recognition or acknowledgement or deservedness. And so that's where we start to actually become toxic in our love for people. You have relatives that you, or, or, or familiars that you interact with, that you love them because you know them, they're part of your ego matrix, your identity matrix, but maybe they do rotten things. And now you're trying to compensate for their rot, for the stench of what they've done, their behavior. And it could be something as simple as they have a certain personality trait that isn't portable outside of the close family circle. And you find yourself going to war for them, fighting for them, standing for them, um, doing all manner of things for them, even when they are undeserving of you. They are undeserving of your efforts. Why are they undeserving? Well, they've done nothing on their part to gain that. All they really are running on is the sentiment of familiarity. I love you, so I, I want the best for you. But for those of us who are offering the radiance of love, that eminence. There's another side to that. A plant needs sun and sunlight. Too much sunlight will destroy or burn a plant. A plant needs water. Too much water will drown the plant. 
actually some of the things I learned from home gardening is sometimes you have to let the plant get thirsty for it to really use the water. You have to prune it so it can grow unencumbered without having the losses associated with the entanglement of other parts of the plant. And so too with people, it is pretty much the same thing, is that what people used to call tough love, I, I, I would say a better word is just love, because sometimes the lesson or the offering for them is not for them to be pleased by you, but for them to be able to function in a world without you, right? The kids who have taken hard knocks, the kids who have suffered uh, for things will always show greater appreciation than those that did not. It's really simple. The struggle creates the character. Interfering with the struggle creates the opposite of a good character. You follow me, Vin? Yes, yeah, E, 100%. And it's interesting when you're talking because I recognize a couple of things. Number one, this whole idea of tough love has changed. So if I look at the way that my parents were raised by my grandparents, and then I compare that to how I was raised by my parents, and then finally how I'm raising my own kids, it's like each generation has gotten softer. <laughs> so uh, probably, I heard this, I shouldn't say probably, I did hear this. I heard when I was growing up that, oh, if I'd behave like this, uh, like you're behaving, then my parents just would not have had it. They wouldn't have tolerated it. You can't imagine what would have happened. We would have been terrified of even even thinking the things that you're saying, uh, let alone acting out, let alone melting down, let alone demanding the toys and uh, the treats or, or whatever else. So you always get this lecture from your parents about how hard things were back when they were growing up. And then I think about my own kids, and I try not to lecture them that way, because uh, when I look at them and if they're misbehaving, I, I look at that as a reflection on me. Uh, so I think it's kind of stupid of me to say, well, I never would have gotten away with that, but it's true. Uh, so my parenting style is also softer than my parents uh, were with me. And so you've got this general decline, and it's not just me. I mean, I talk to people who are within plus or minus 10 years of me, and they've seen the same thing. Uh, so they've had the same experience with their parents and with their children. And then I look at that and compare it to what's happening in society. And as we've talked about, we've also gotten to this weird point in our world where you can't offend anyone. Everyone has to be validated. Everyone needs to get a pat on the back. So you've talked about this before, Z, with regard to martial arts, how you used to go in and go for a belt test once a year and if you fail that belt test, then you would have to wait another year. And in that year, you made sure that you practiced hard enough so that there was no chance that you were going to fail again because you didn't want to go through that experience. Whereas now you have belt tests and you pay to get the belt and you get the belt. And that's how these companies make money. Uh, you see it in school. We've got this phenomenon where honors classes are being taken away because there's a sense that everyone should be equal and we shouldn't segregate kids and tell some that they're smarter or better than others. Uh, this idea that everyone deserves a trophy, everyone deserves to be told that they're equally valid. That to me seems to mirror what's happening with parenting. And maybe it's not even mirroring. I mean, maybe it's cause and effect, right? Maybe we've changed the parenting style and that's changed the way that people function. And they're not able to tolerate criticism. They're not able to look at themselves with a critical lens. They're too afraid of being wrong or looking foolish. And people around them want to spare them that pain, or it's become socially unacceptable to have those conversations. So it's better to just lie or hide the truth and talk about how things are really okay. So it, I don't know, but talk a little bit about that. I mean, what do you think is the relationship between the individual level, uh, which is this trend that we've seen maybe towards less and less tough love, 
and what we're seeing socially, which is this aversion to criticism, this extreme need for validation, and this inability to say anything offensive. Do you see those two as connected? Yeah, I, I like to get into this part, but I want us to be real careful with our way we speak and narrative. I don't think that there can be a term called tough love un unless there's something called weak love or fragile love or half-assed love. A love stands on its own. It doesn't uh, need anybody if it's really in its full expression. Again, unsolicited devotion. You have a, there, it's a subjective thing where somebody, you, you love people because they're close to you or they offer you something or, or anything like that. And I would say it's really something we can monitor in our everyday living that the ideas that you put forth where people are constantly adjusting life so everybody wins a reward, everybody's happy. That means that there's no love anymore. There's, because love isn't always uh, sweet and, and cute. Sometimes it's just bland and rough and there every day and it's consistent. Um, the deepest ways that we can get into the elements of love is the endurance of a beloved to see to it that the, the object of their love is doing well and is able to do well even outside of their reach. So when you think of good parenting love, you see a person, they're older, maybe they're in their 50s or 60s, they're, they're finally an orphan, and they carry these wonderful traits with them that their parents gave them, their dad or their mom, an auntie, an uncle, gave them certain qualities and traits that they can function in the world. That, that was a loving relationship. Inversely, you see people who are just a feral mess they never had that. They never had restraints. They never had limits put on them. They never had um, uh, discipline. And these are not people you even want to know, right? They're not even people you even want to know. And you see from their behavior. Um, what we can do in loving relationships, which is very challenging to do, is as we do that introspection first, we go out and we we try to have heavy conversations with our loved ones to their capacity. I'm not saying you do this with small children. You do this with adults in your life. And you really test it. If somebody loves you, but it has certain sanctions and limits on what you can say and do, then that's not a loving relationship. It's a transactional relationship. And you just need to know that, that, okay, I'm good to a point with this person. Then after that point, we're no good. I know, I know where I can go. And those relationships, believe it or not, are okay too. It doesn't mean it's all bad because you can't do everything with that person. You want to honor um, their limits. You want to honor their range of expression. That's all. And you don't have to beat yourself up and go, oh, my God, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not living up to something or I'm mistreating. No. If you love a person, sometimes, sometimes they'll be pissed off at you. Sometimes. If you love a person and they love you, sometimes you're mad at each other. Sometimes. Sometimes but you always make your way back around, right? And, and if we're doing it just to stay comfortable, that's problematic. That's very problematic. We don't want to do it just to be comfortable. We want to do it because it's a good thing to do. And when you think that you're loving a person by introducing suffering, harm, or handicapping them, that's more about ego gratification than it is loving. It's more about the rewards of a faux love than the true gifts of a dispassionate, unconditional love. There are periods of time with your children where they'll just be mad at you and you'll be mad at them. That's it. We're just mad. We're just walking around mad at each other. I don't want to talk to you. You don't want to talk to me but we're going to function. 
And at the end of the day, you did a noble thing. You did the right thing. You made good decisions. All those things, right? But you can't do that if your main priority is to leave in joy and happiness and tickles and giggles in the short term. In the long term, it's just slogging through the mundane. Let's do what's right. What about being in love with your partner? It's not always about the good times. It's what sets the good times up. That you've invested good resources, good love, good conversation, good work. You've done your therapy. You've done all that. And then you act upon it. And then when the resistance of that acting upon it hits you, and sometimes it doesn't feel good, you weather that storm, you endure, you hang in there, you go deeper into it, you don't back away, you don't hide, you don't cower away from it. And, and so we can exercise that part of us by following these kind of simple protocols. The first thing is understanding that love isn't always a festive thing. Sometimes it's just good work. It's just good work. You know what I mean, Vin? Yeah, when you're talking, Z, I'm thinking a lot about my own family. And the word that comes to mind is functional. So maybe part of love is making sure someone else is as functional as possible. And part of that is self-sufficiency. Part as a family is making sure that the thing runs. You know, it's like if you love your car, you want to make sure that it's in good working condition, that you change the oil, tires are aligned, all the parts are working properly. And you're right. Sometimes it takes effort. It takes discomfort. It takes a little bit of pain. I look at this very recently. I mean, it's very relevant to me because I've gone through this a lot in of the last six months. I mean, we got to a point in my family where certain things just weren't working. And I wouldn't say it was catastrophic. I mean, it wasn't like we were on the brink of collapse, but I looked at my kids and there were certain behaviors that I didn't like. I looked at our finances, uh, certain things weren't working out. You know, we were spending more than uh, than is really sustainable. Uh, uh, so, th and that was creating stress, which I felt like really didn't need to be there. You know, it's uh, one more rock or burden that you're carrying around, which is interrupting your daily flow and your peace of mind, uh, which is avoidable. Uh, so there was that. Uh, there were behaviors that we were dealing with, uh, with the kids and with us too. Uh, so just the way that we were interacting as a family was causing problems and was causing stress. And I went through this period recently where I just put in a lot more discipline and put in limits around everything and said, okay, if we've got social media, I mean, my kids are too young for social media, but uh, devices, let's put a lot more limits around devices because that's causing problems. We need limits around the stuff that we eat because we can't have sugar the first thing in the morning. That sets a terrible tone for the day. We can't have eruptions and all kinds of behavior problems. Uh, there are things between me and my wife that we have to correct. And some of this is painful. I mean, my kids, you know how kids are. They're basically mercenaries. It's like you do what they want. <laughs> you go and you buy them some ice cream and they're like, yeah, you're the best dad ever. We love you so much. And then suddenly you turn around and you say, okay, you've watched enough TV. You got to turn this off. And it's a screaming match. It's like, God, we hate you. You're terrible. I wish you weren't my dad. I wish we had someone else. But whatever, it's part of it. And for me, it was exactly what he said. It was saying, I want this unit, I mean, my kids, me, my wife, to be as functional as possible, to work as well as possible, to live up to our potential as much as possible. And so we have to make some changes. We have to put in some discipline. We have to put in some limits. We have to have more of this tough love. And at times it caused pain. Uh, there was a period a few weeks ago, my wife didn't talk to me for two days. I mean, she would give me some monosyllabic responses, a yes, no, hi, whatever, but she basically didn't talk to me. She was pissed off. And my view was, you know what? I'm sorry, but I don't care. Uh, like, I do care, but this is just how it is. And I'm not going to back down because I know that long term, this is in our collective best interest. So this is a path that we agreed to. 
this is how we're going to move forward together. And we're not going to veer from that. Uh, and what I find interesting, Z, is that when you start giving those limits and having that discipline, people will actually appreciate it. So it's not just people who are peers who might appreciate that. Uh, even my kids and my kids, a lot of times I think of as feral animals. I mean, even though I love them to death, they're, you've talked about it. The kids don't have frontal lobes fully developed, so they kind of do whatever they want to do. But even my kids appreciate having discipline and having limits in their more clear moments. And so, of course, when you're going through something and there's an argument, they're not appreciating it. But at other times when they're more calm and they're just talking, my oldest will say to me, yeah, you know what? I do need that. I do need discipline. I feel better uh, when I'm not watching the iPad all day or when I'm eating better uh, or w when you're helping me and you're forcing me to do my homework on my own instead of taking me through every single step. Because even at that age, they, they recognize it. They recognize that there's some value. And if you can't manage yourself, which as a kid, almost by definition, you can't. That's why you've got parents who are there to take care of you and raise you. You need that help. You need that assistance. You need that sandbox to play in uh, where uh, within the sandbox, things are cool. But you go outside and you know that things are going to go off the rails a little bit. And so it, that to me has been very interesting. And I, I do think about love. I don't know if I think about it differently than I did, but I've certainly implemented it differently uh, more recently. And we'll see how this goes. But at least the last few months, it's been a good process. I, I think we're now getting back on the right track, uh, or at least we're on a better trajectory than we were before. What I find interesting is that this took a bit of pain to get to, but again, it wasn't catastrophic. Like, we didn't have to get to the point where my kids were failing out of school uh, or uh, we were out on the street because we couldn't pay our our mortgage. There was some pain and uh, some discomfort, and then we adjusted. But you see a lot of situations which are just horrible situations, which seem extremely dysfunctional, where people are sheltered, where the bad behavior that someone else enables is awful. I mean, the child is spoiled or the spouse or the partner are, uh, they don't know how to take care of themselves. Maybe they have drinking problems, substance abuse problems, domestic violence, and so forth. And you would think that in those situations, people would be able to step back and say, okay, what I'm doing isn't working. So maybe this feels really hard. It feels really hard to say no, uh, to set some boundaries, to change the way that I interact with someone but I'm going to do it because I know it's in our collective best interest. But there's so many situations, even as we're talking now, that come to mind. I mean, some outside of my family, some within my family, where it's kind of like, even though the evidence is right there that this approach isn't working, the people are still going down the same path. And if you talk to them about it, it's, oh, yeah, well, what else can I do? What else do you expect? Uh, these are my kids, or this is my beloved, and... Uh, I have to do this. I have to be there for whatever they need, even though by being there, uh, you're not allowing them to correct the problems that they're running into. You're not allowing them to get up and, and be more self-sufficient. You're actually doing them a disservice. So what is it, Z? I mean, what separates the situations where on the one hand, we're able to recognize it and course correct? And on the other hand, uh, we it's almost like we, we don't even know anything else. Vin, it's, it's pretty simple for all of us. You guys, it's pretty simple. We must, um, you know, look in the mirror at, 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 at the nature of the ego. I know I say this all the time. Um, because you can't fix other people. You can only fix yourself. And what you can do with others is be the best example you could be with some sort of prompting of could, promoting intelligence. And one of the sad things is when you hear stories about people who aren't speaking to each other or they're at that breaking point, you'll never get those times back. You'll simply waste your time. There is no upside to it that is worth that person. So you always ask your partner before you start an argument or before you get caught up into something, Either say to them or say to yourself, is it worth our life? Is this 
battle we're going to have worth our life? Is it going to be worth you and I never spe seeing or speaking to each other again? Is it worth the loss of affection and comfort? And if you start just taking that moment to think about that, you realize that most of the time it's not worth it. It's based on ego, one-upsmanship, who's in charge, and it's being a petty dictator, a petty uh, emperor of a minor insignificant prefect or dominion, right? It's like you're just wasting your time. Be good to the people in your life. Think about the fights that just aren't worth it. Regrettably, I think about what you were saying. You get into a thing with your wife. You guys are right on the edge, maybe not talking. And if you step back and look at it, none of it was worth it. It was like It's like a line struggle. They need to see it my way. I need it to see it their way. Somebody needs to um, be submissive. Somebody needs to be uh, the ruler. Uh, or I need to make a point. Uh, they need to suffer and I need to see them suffer. If you start thinking about that stuff, it gets really, really sick. And so what we can do is check our ego all the time. In this short life, in the grand scheme of things, what is really important? You can't control other people's behaviors or attitudes or wants or dislikes. You can just be the best person you can be. And if they're the best person they can be, they can appreciate you. They can uh, love you. They can be warm towards you. They may even step away from you. But there's no reason for us to suffer for the sake of the ego. So if we really work with each other in an intelligent way, again, it requires intelligence. You can think, okay, I'm pissed off at them because of this and that. Let me deconstruct that. It really is not worth it. Then you look at something else. Ah, you know what? This wasn't worth it. Maybe the idea that you feel like you win is the biggest thing in the world. When, when if you win and your loved ones lose, there's no benefit to that. None at all. So let us really work on appreciating the people in our lives, acknowledging that we're not that interesting, we're not that important, and that you can actually get along with people. And you don't have to be just like them. And they may disagree with certain things you're doing. How about just step away? Step away. I'm going to let you do your thing. You, I'm going to do mine, and we'll meet in the middle. We'll meet where we're comfortable. We'll meet. Um, where we can benefit one another. How about that, Vin? Well, there's so many stories of people who are, I guess ego is probably the best term. You know, it's either blinded by ego or blinded by rage or whatever the emotions are. And maybe those emotions ultimately go back to the ego. I've seen couples who go through horrific divorces and they're just intent on destroying each other. Like there's so much pain that they want to burn the other person to the ground. But then they've got kids and they love the kids and the kids are traumatized. They've got psychological issues. They're on medication because they're so anxious. They can't function socially. But there's almost either not an awareness of that or your emotions and your ego just overwhelm your, your common sense your intelligence, your sense of perspective, your sense Z is you're saying of what is really important. I mean, what am I here on this planet for? What do I care about? And it's just a horrific path to go down. Uh, so I think having that, that ego restraint makes a lot of sense in, in any relationship. Going back to this topic of love, I mean, maybe the ego is part of it as well. I don't really know. I mean, it's it's just kind of weird to me the more that I think about it because so much of this should be obvious. And maybe that's also a theme of our podcast. A lot of what we talk about should be obvious, but people, and when I say people, myself included, we, we have difficulty implementing this advice that logically makes a lot of sense. 
But at times I, I look at relationships and I almost think about third parties. So you have a caretaker, a, a nanny or a teacher or someone who is looking after your child for a particular point of uh, point in time. And it's a completely different dynamic. So, yeah, they, they want to get paid. They've got a job to do. That's a different relationship. But because they're not so emotionally invested, they're willing to do things that are more painful. They're willing to listen to the kid cry or scream or whine or whatever. And I don't know if you've noticed this. I know this is a lot that you go to an airport or a playground and you can hear a kid scream. And sometimes you'll hear a kid scream and it sort of sounds like your kid and it's very upsetting. But then you realize it's some other kid and you just don't care. <laughs> it's like, all right, I can tune that out. I don't have to worry about it because my kid's all right. And of course, there are situations where they're actually in danger and then it makes sense. You, you want to make sure they're fine. You want to swoop in, take them to the hospital, resuscitate them, get them to start breathing again, whatever the case may be. But if it's not that and they're just whining and complaining, I guess there's just something in us which is so attuned uh, to the distress and discomfort of the people around us. So I don't know if that's ego Z or if, it's, if that's something else. I mean, I'm curious what what do you think about that? But either way, it's kind of like we need to cultivate that that intelligence so that we can override some of these instincts that we have. Because if we just follow the instinct, then it's always a path of accommodation. It's the path of least conflict. It's the path of least resistance. It's, okay, let me get the smile uh, from my partner or my child or my friend. Uh, let me have the easy conversation. Let me feel like the big person because I can swoop in and brighten up their day a little bit. But if you add up all those days and all of the accommodations that you make, you end up with someone who can't stand on their own two feet, uh, who uh, you haven't done them any favors. And in fact, you could argue that they'd be better off without you because if they didn't have you there, they'd be forced to take matters into their own hands. Uh, so it, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, why are these instincts so hard to override? And also, if we recognize they're hard to override, I mean, we talked about ego, but are there other things we can do to step back from the situation and maybe make more intelligent decisions? Well, again, it goes back to management of the ego. And you mentioned intelligence. Um, we all benefit from acknowledging within our own selves and the privacy of our own heart that we don't know everything and we're working on being more intelligent in all manner, especially when it comes to emotional issues that then conjure up more ego. But again, it's not that everyone can deal with this. Most people, I, regrettably, we live in a kind of a feral, primordial stew of, of madness. I feel this way. I feel that way. It should be this. It should be that. Uh, I'm going to live forever and I need the world to adjust to me. All these kinds of twisted narratives. And where we can work on it is really learning to listen. And then before we react or respond, listen even more. What is the real problem? Where is the conflict? Is it the idea of who's in charge, who's right or wrong? We want to start pulling all that out of our interaction and strive mainly for harmony. If we find that we are not speaking to one another, somebody in that interaction would benefit by subjugating their sense of reward and uh, the idea of accomplishment or I win and they lose. Let go of all that, because the real win is when the family and the community does well. That's the big win. The individual win has its own reward, but it is very limited. The real reward is when you have harmony in your community, within your, with your loved ones. Like the situation you said, where somebody's so angry they're not speaking then go back to the basics. What if they're dead? Do you want them dead? 
What are you really mad about? And oftentimes you're mad because you simply want to be the victor in a petty game. Let, let the loved one have the reward. Let, them, let it go. Let it go. Let's have harmony. Let's strive to have a collective interaction together that is, draws us abundance and more love, and we can end every day on a higher note. If you're not doing that, you're wasting your time. If you find yourself in, in conflict that's based on who wins and who loses, you've already lost. The most precious thing you have is your connection you have with the people you love. You find yourself so mad at your spouse or they're mad at you over something that you won't even remember in a week or two. You just wasted your time and you, you lost days you'll never get back. It's really that simple. You follow me, Vin? Yeah, I'll just add one more thought I had as you were talking, which is we tend to take our feelings very seriously in today's day and age. That if we feel angry, we should do something about it. We should confront the person. If we feel guilty, that means that we're doing something wrong. If we feel pain and emotional distress, then let's quickly run away from that and get to a different sort of a state. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that impulse. Uh, but again, we need to check it. Because to me, these are all signals. Uh, so you take an emotional signal, and it's a sign that you need to check in and ask whether things are okay or not. And sometimes they're perfectly fine. So sometimes, yeah, maybe it is painful to be in a situation where someone is accusing you of not loving them or you're bringing them to tears, not because you are trying to inflict distress, but you're having a tough conversation that they need to hear, uh, or you're dealing with tantrums, uh, all kinds of behavior that, yeah, we don't want to be around, uh, but just because it feels uncomfortable doesn't mean that we have to shift course. We should check in and say, is this a situation where we want to do something differently? But a lot of times it could be no. Uh, we want to stay the course, and the pain is a part of it. And we can accept the pain, ignore it, and move on, and just trust the process. Trust that things are going to get better. And as long as we have conviction in our intentions, conviction in our action, we know that we're on a path that's, that is going to get us to a better place. Uh, so I, I would just, in uh, closing, add to what you said, Z, uh, which is, yeah, we need to maintain the open lines of communication we need to check the ego. We need to make sure that we're not blowing petty problems out of proportion. Uh, but maybe we also need to stop taking ourselves so seriously and just recognize that as human beings, we have all kinds of crazy thoughts and emotions, but we've also got that part of us which can step back, that dispassionate observer part, uh, which is the heart of the discussions that we have. How do we cultivate that intelligence to step back and ask ourselves, do we need to follow a certain path or do we want to stick to our guns? Are we willing to take a little bit of discomfort for better long-term outcomes? Uh, and maybe if we can just put in that pause, that pause between what we feel and what we do, we can end up in a better place. And you're right, man. And I'd, I'd say in closing is I would like for us all to consider how precious and valuable life is. And life is an illusion. It's transient. It is shorter than you think. And there's no reason to be mad at each other, people in your, that you love. There's no energy you need to invest in people that don't support you or care about you or love you. Not everybody will like you for the hell of it. Um, you have, if you, but if you have really good friendships and good connections with people, nurture those. You have a certain bandwidth in this life a certain amount you can affect and very little you can control. Try to not waste your time with idleness and quarreling, especially when you find yourself in a, a situation where you're not really communicating, you're not speaking, you're just walking around mad. Find a way, an adjustment you could kick back on your own with no resolution in mind and just say, is it worth it? Here comes the storm, or you know that the storm is coming. How do you hunker down and weather the storm? 
don't find yourself outside exposed to the harsh environment of the storm because of some foolhardiness, uh, foolhardly behavior that you're experiencing. Try to end your day on a high note with your beloved. Try to start your day on a high note. Manage the ups and downs in that way of gratitude, reward, praise, and gratitude. Just, I'm grateful I got you. Then go do it. But remember, there are very few things that are worth the negative stuff we put into it. Just love each other the best we can. And when you can't, step away and get out of people's way. It's really that simple. Love and support or get out of their way. Nowhere in between. All right, Vin? All right. Yeah, I like that. Very simple, straightforward advice. So at least I can follow that. Uh, it's pretty clear. Pretty clear. Yeah, we all can. We all can. That's all we can do. Anything more spoils it. All right. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcasting app. Each five-star review helps us bring you more unique and insightful content. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. Peace.